And, and David, you are my first guest of 2023. And what, a, what, what an amazing guest. I mean, oh, I'm is... honored. I'm honored. Thank you, Monty. We good. It means that we, also we, we work, you know, because some people at the 2nd of January, they still on holidays. They think, no, I mean, you know, we will go back. Also, I think in Italy, they have um, this thing called Befana, which is a kind sort of holidays. And then, so you, you arrive at mid-gen that you haven't started working yet, basically. <laughs> But we're back in business immediately. Back in business. I actually, that week between Christmas and New Year's, I love it. Um, usually not as a vacation week, but as a week when everything is quiet, nobody else is working, and I can be at my desk and get a lot of things done. And it seems almost like a free week that has been added to the year because, because everyone's expectations are so low. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And no one, no one want to be, you know, uh, disturbed uh, and they are thinking about everything else and there is time. Did, did you write a lot in this, uh, in this period? Uh, I worked on, there? I worked on editing, helping my wife edit her second book. She is about to deliver her second book. My wife is a, a an environmental historian uh, and uh, has published a book called American Zion about public lands and right-wing militias and is finishing her second. And so we were both working hard on it during the Christmas holiday. Oh, gosh. How is working with your wife? You know, I never <laughs> would have thought of marrying another writer, but I married her before she was a writer. She was a historian uh, and a right. conservationist. She was running a conservation organization. And then she went back to grad school and did a PhD in history. And then she decided to turn her PhD dissertation into a book. And I helped some with the editing. And now I've helped with this. And it would be very dangerous, I think, and unpleasant to, to edit your spouse's work, except she is so capable of accepting my suggestions. She's so grateful for what I offer that she never argues with me she never says she never wants me to say oh it's perfect just send it hit send she really really wants the kind of help that i'm able to give so it works fine it works well that's fantastic i asked you because uh, sometimes you know uh, there are moments when my wife has to try a new dress and that's the worst moment in my life because if i say the truth is not gonna work so i i, I developed this theory after a, a friend of a girlfriend of mine said uh, i said look what, what you have to do when your wife comes to you with a new dress well what what, sh what should you say because if you say the truth some i mean some dress are not good you know it has nothing to do with the person and she said you always have to start saying wow wow that's amazing you know and then you will say anything but then that has to be the first reaction i think that's wise i think that's good advice and i would also say that you know offering criticism of a book is one thing you know but address yeah. address <laughs> <laughs> that's much more delicate touchy dangerous and i won't say important but but yes i I do not offer criticisms of, of dresses nearly as easily as I can offer criticisms <laughs> of a mere book manuscript. That's a good point. I was playing, uh, uh, David, in, in this period with this tool called uh, ChatGPT. I don't know if you um, had your hands on it. No, It's no, basically, no. Um, there is this company called OpenAI, originally found and again by Elon Musk. And, and then he, he went off and, um, and they are developing a lot of in, um, artificial intelligence, algorithm and so on. And then mm -hmm. they came out like three weeks ago, two weeks ago, maybe with this uh, chat GPT. And it's a, a chatbot that, you know, chatbot, uh, you, they, they never really work very well. But this thing is insane. And you basically write something and say, look, um, write an article about COVID um, in China and, and, and you give some, a prompt, a description. And this tool is amazing, write in an amazing way. So you can write contracts, articles, uh, code for, the, and I was really impressed. So I started to really think, wow, um, what, what's going to happen? I mean, the, the job of a writer, uh, a journalist, someone who does videos, 
uh, because then you have this deep fake, so you could get the script from this AI, then you get your voice clone and you have your deep fake. So it's better than myself, you know, in doing a video. So I, I thought a lot about it. And of course, it can be also a tool to help a writer, but I, I was really impressed. Uh, so also for research, for instance. It, it sounds uh, very of, dangerous uh, in terms of use by students though. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, um, I mean because imagine you have homework, you just click and you, yeah. and you get everything done. Yeah, if I, uh, I'm not threatened by that as a, as a writer, as an author, but if I were a teacher, I would feel threatened by that. How am I going to make sure that my students actually learn to write themselves and do the writing, the research and the writing themselves, rather than using this, what is it, WeChat GPT? Chat GPT, yeah. Chat, G, Chat GPT. Yeah, that that seems to me problematic. As a writer, to me, one of the most important parts of writing is the voice, the voice, the human voice of the writer. And I, voice is, a, you know, as we use it in English and literary uh, sense, I don't know what its equivalent might be in Italian or other languages, but it's very important, but very hard to define. It's not exactly style. It's not your grammar. It's not just your use of language. It's the way you you deliver a sense of your own character, the deep character of the writer in printed words on a page. Uh, and you, you use that, hopefully, to cause readers to trust you, cause readers to like you, cause readers to be willing to turn the page. The voice. Yeah. And I don't know how AI can deliver voice. I'm sure it can deliver research. I'm sure it can deliver well-structured grammar, but voice, I would be dubious. Yeah, it, it will be interesting to see. Um, I, 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 when I was using it, the other thing, and I, I wanted to ask you about it, is um, that every answer look uh, legit and uh, and and tr and true, but is is not really necessarily true or you know um, real. But it sounds good. And uh, thinking, you know, about COVID, about all the the topics that you 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 talked about also in in these years, I thought, wow, it's amazing, you know, because. Um, it can you ask something and the this tool can give you a perfect answer that sounds reasonable against or pro a topic you know mm -hmm. covid exists yes covid doesn't exist uh, and and you think wow that it, it is is right in uh, <laughs> both ways oh, wow. so it's a big challenge i think also for humans to start to develop their critical thinking about a topic uh, I don't know. I, I, I was really uh, playing with it and I got a lot of doubts, you know. I, I started playing thinking, oh, that's fun. And then I thought, mm, I don't know what, what will happen. Yeah, yeah. So we can, we can subcontract to this AI app, subcontract our own risks, not just our own research and our own writing, but our own argumentation, our own critical thinking, our own logic in support of an argument. That's, I find that scary. I share your sense that that's problematic. Yeah. I don't know what we well, can do about it though. I, I, I don't know, but we'll find out soon, I think. Yeah. It's going very fast. It's spreading very fast in, 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 a, in a lot of sectors. Uh, and staying on, on the spreading fast, uh, but what is the situation about COVID, COVID in this moment? Because I was in uh, London, for instance, for um, mm -hmm. a pantomime. Do you have pantomime in US? No, we don't. You know, like Christmas pantomime? Yeah. Uh, no, but in the early 70s, I spent two years at Oxford University. And Got it. So I, I have experienced Christmas pantomimes and how wonderful they can be. <laughs> and it, it was like a pantomime and it was a, a theater packed with people, kids, um, senior people and, and everyone coughing and, you know, like, I, I thought, wow, that's, that's insane for me, you know, because mm -hmm. I have, a, as an Italian, I have a different perception 
than yeah. maybe British people. And, uh, yeah. and, um, but you know, it, the feeling is all right, that's it. It's done. Um, let's go with our life. And, uh, yeah, maybe in China now there is some people coming, but, but there is no like zero, um, war, worried at all. What, what's the situation? Well, it's, it's very peculiar. People are tired of COVID. People have COVID fatigue. Yeah, I've written a book about COVID and even I'm tired of COVID. And yet I know it's still important. It is still fascinating to me. It's still changing. It's still a dynamic situation. The virus is still here. People can say, as Joe Biden has said, well, the pandemic is over. But that's really just semantics. To say the pandemic is over and now we're in the endemic phase it doesn't mean anything until you carefully define those words. And most people can't define those words. Um, the virus is still there. I think that I think every human on the planet is going to be exposed to this virus, not necessarily infected, but exposed to it because some people seem for reasons we don't understand naturally resistant to it, a very small, you know, percentage of people, but others at this point either have been vaccinated and boosted or have been perhaps vaccinated and had a case of COVID that have resistance to it, have immunity to it to some degree. And so we're going on with our lives, except in certain places such as China, which is now getting its turn. You know, China is about to be where Northern Italy was in March of 2020, no if why. it's not already there. Um, so, I'm not wearing a mask right now. I'm riding airplanes without a mask, but I've been vaccinated. I've had five shots plus a right. case of COVID. And so I feel like at least for a while, I should be immune, uh, immune to being infected again or and immune to transmitting it to other people. I hope so. But if um, if the virus continues to evolve, enough to be able to escape the immune defenses of someone like me with five vaccinations plus a case of COVID, then I will be ready to put on a mask again. I'll be ready to get another booster. This virus is going to be with us forever and we'll have to keep getting um, new versions of vaccine just the way we do for influenza, I think. Right, right. And uh, I when when you like research a topic like that uh, and by the way your your new book i i read the the italian um the the, the italian title is i think senza respiro which is a, a great respiro. title by the way it's like well, without breathing like mm -hmm. uh, but it, it also means you know when you are um how can i say when you're scared you you remain senza respiro you like you know you you have that um but feeling so it's got a, an interesting meaning also um Good. not only yeah. the physiological meaning and um when you research for a book like that um what kind of data how, how do you gather the right data because for me often for instance if i check the chinese situation i read an article the other day that said in beijing i don't know 40 percent of population got covid and you think wow that's a big number but if I want to double check that number, I don't know how to do it. Where exactly do I get it? Is the, is, is, is the source is, uh, is a real source? Can I trust that source? Uh, I don't know. So I was curious about your um, research, researching process when you need to gather data. All right. Well, it, it's an important question. Uh, it's a question for everybody to be thinking about as we deal with this problem of misinformation, um, fake news, disinformation, uh, people picking up all sorts of assertions from a little bit of Googling on the internet and thinking now they know that the virus came from a laboratory leak and other things, conspiracy theories. How do we deal with that? Well, critical thinking, um, we've mentioned that's part of it. And part of critical thinking is, uh, asking for evidence. How do you know? What's your evidence for that? But the other, another part of critical thinking is, well, who are you that's saying this? What are your qualifications? Let's look behind this particular assertion and see who's making the assertion and how qualified he or she is. 
So that's what I do also when I researched this book, Breathless, Senza Respiro. Uh, I spoke by Zoom with 95 experts around the world, uh, virologists, uh, epidemiologists, um, some public health people, but mostly virologists, uh, evolutionary biologists, and epidemiologists. And um, some of them I knew from previous work. I, I've been writing about this subject for about 20 years. And so I know some of these people and they have been trustworthy in the past and they have, they have very sterling reputations as, for instance, molecular evolutionary virologists. They're not just somebody who's saying something. They're a, a professional who has worked in this field for decades. So I rely on those people and I rely also on a sense of to what extent is there consensus among them. So I've got a scientific source named Eddie Holmes at University of Sydney. I've got a scientific source named Michael Warraby at the University of Arizona. I've got a scientific source named Marion Koopmans. She's in Rotterdam. I'm interested in what each of them says, but I'm also interested in what they agree on, the three of them. And if the three of them agree on something, then I feel pretty confident that it's probably um, it's probably a, a strong um, scientific assertion. That is uh, often a problem that I see. Uh, there is always exception. There is always someone who is out of the of the consensus, and and then sometimes maybe I I don't know after years, maybe that person was right and people say ah oh, you know so that then how can i trust the science again you know so there is this uh ongoing uh debate that i see on social media of course i live on social media you know I, among all of this you know platforms comments and and what i sense is a total chaos that people don't, doesn't really understand and who is the let's say who, who is smarter using social media then is right basically you know it's like uh, and 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 the other problem is that social media rewards uh, a, an extreme view of things so if i do a video uh, like i don't know andrew tate now is like the the persona that, that a lot of people talk about in this period just got to jail and uh, and i i it's interesting because if you are extreme you are rewarded by the algorithm because you get views because you say something, wow, the people is shocked. The more views you are, the more authoritative you become. That, that's crazy, you know? So it's like a, it's a very weird uh, loop that is not like, like, like before. So I, I don't know how you, you, you can avoid this trap. Well, I think this is, um, this is something that we have to work on as a society uh, to deal with this, this whole problem of, people being misled by unreliable information, by dramatic claims that are put up on social media. And you're right, dramatic claims on social media do attract a lot of, a lot of eyes, a lot of clicks, and a lot of followers. Um, and, and most of social media, I mean, I use Twitter. I don't, I don't use much of anything else. I don't use TikTok. Uh, I don't use Facebook, but I do use Twitter. And a lot of scientists still use Twitter, even despite Elon Musk. Um, but Twitter is, what is it now, 280 characters? Now we get 280 characters. Well, right. to, to conduct a, a complex scientific discussion, let alone an argument, in these bits of 280 characters is very difficult and precarious except now that we have threat now we have threads so a, a scientist will say well here's a new thread on the latest thoughts about the the virus variants in China and there will be you know 10 or 11 posts as a thread mm. and then we all know how to we all know how to uh, unroll that thread and get the whole thing uh, in one piece and print it out if we want it or just read it. Um, but still, um, it's a bad format in which to discuss really complex scientific things. One of the things we have to do, I think, and this is related to that, is educate our citizenry, <clears throat> in particular our young people, because they are they are our best hope in terms of being able to actually, you know, uh, educate people about 
not just what science says, but what science is, what science mm -hmm. is and how science works. So people see something like, as you've mentioned, somebody who seems to be a crank, he's in the minority, he's a voice in the wilderness, and he makes some claim. And then it turns out to be correct a year or two later. And suddenly, you know, he's got a million followers on Twitter and people think that, that he can be relied on. Um, part of the problem is that people don't understand how science works. Science works by uh, hypothesizing explanations and then supporting them with empirical evidence and correcting itself. Sometimes this, this, the prevailing scientific opinion turns out to be wrong, but the process of science is capable of detecting that and correcting that. That's how, uh, that's how we went centuries ago from the, from the Ptolemaic view of the universe with the earth at the center to, to a much more complex um, view of the universe and of our solar system with the sun at the center, thanks to Galileo and Copernicus and Kepler, who corrected the Ptolemaic view of the universe that had worked well for 1500 years. That's the way science still works. Einstein corrects Isaac Newton and someone else corrects Einstein. And gradually we get closer and closer to an accurate, an accurate and reliable understanding of, of the physical universe. So we have to, we have to help um, young people grow into an understanding of science by teaching them at the age of you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, teaching um, young people, not just, um, not just history, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but also critical thinking and a little bit about science. And I think that we can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, probably the, the problem is also that when I see uh, politicians or CEOs um, of, of uh, public traded companies, they always have to act like they have the solution. Mm -hmm. So if Zuckerberg mm -hmm. says something, he, he can't say, look, guys, we have no idea how to do this, but, you know, we'll try to figure it out. No, he has to say content moderation. No problem. We got this, you know, or like the yeah. Italian politicians are masters in this. Right. They, right. Berlusconi for 30 years, he yeah. always did his political campaign saying, guys, I got this. Uh, no yeah. more war problems. <laughs> Stuck will be no problem. I got the solution. I, B, C, easy as a piece of cake, vote for me. And, yeah. uh, and yeah. so the, this um, storytelling of the strong man and someone That's who right. got all the... Solutions. That's right. Yeah. And, and Trump did that too. You know, oh, the virus, oh, yeah. don't worry about it. It'll, it'll disappear like magic. It'll disappear like magic. We got this. One person who um, did, um, I think, of an important public service in reminding people that science is always provisional was Tony Fauci. Um, during the first two years, because he would occasionally say, well, um, you shouldn't wear masks. Don't wear masks unless you're infected, unless you're a healthcare worker, because we don't have enough masks right now. Our supply chain is behind and we have a shortage of masks and healthcare workers need them. And then a month or two later, he said, well, the general public should wear masks. People said, well, you've changed your mind. And he said, right. well, what hasn't changed is the way scientific information works and the judgments we make based on the best scientific information we have about the situation at a given time. So yes, sometimes we will change our recommendations. We will change what we say. That's how science works. What, what was um, for your uh, um, Sensor Spiro book, uh, um, one of the, the, the or, or some of the most interesting um, conversations that, that you had or uh, things that you learned that you didn't know before and you thought, wow, this I didn't expect that. There was some wow moment during these uh, conversations, uh, something that stuck in your head. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I was uh, I was fascinated and surprised when I talk, I mentioned this uh, virologist, Eddie Holmes at the University of Sydney. He's an Englishman, but he's, he's at the University of Sydney in Australia. <clears throat> and he works closely with Chinese scientists, Chinese virologists on the, the evolutionary biology of viruses. And he studies genomes. He can look at a genome, 30,000 letters of a genome. 
and he can see things that most uh, that other people don't see. This is this is his professional niche. And he was working with scientific uh, colleagues in China, including a, a professor named Yongzhen Zhang in Shanghai. And they, um, they sequenced this virus, the new coronavirus, very, very early on in January of 2020. They got the genomic sequence to it. The genomic sequence was going to be very important in understanding what this virus was, how it worked, how we might defend ourselves against it, and also the question of where it came from. Was it an engineered virus or was it a natural virus? So Eddie Holmes told me the story about how his colleague Zhang had this virus sequenced on January 6th, 2020, very early on. And Eddie was saying, Zhang, we have to release this sequence to the world. We have to make this public. People need this for vaccine development, other purposes. And there was a lot of political pressure on Zhang Chinese authorities were saying, don't talk about this, don't share information, don't do anything. And Eddie told me the story of how, how this man, Professor Zhang, was on an airplane, ready to fly up to see his bosses in Beijing from Shanghai. And Eddie was saying to him, we've got to release it. And Zhang, they were closing the doors of the airplane. He was buckling into his seat. This was on January, uh, the morning of January 11th. 2020. And he finally said, okay, Eddie, I'll have my postdoc in my lab, send you the genome, you release it. The postdoc sent Eddie the genome. Eddie had it for 52 minutes. Um, he was in conversation then with a colleague in Edinburgh running a website that publishes um, uh, early information, early scientific information before it can be in a journal paper. And within 52 minutes, that genome went up publicly on that website. And then it was 8 p.m. on Friday night in Washington, D.C. Tony Fauci gets this genome. Barney Graham at the Vaccine Research Center gets this genome. And that hour, they begin working toward what becomes the Moderna vaccine. Right. With a speed that has never been remotely approached. When I interviewed Tony Fauci, I asked him, what's the most important decision that you made in 2020? And he said, well, a political decision or scientific? And I said, well, you're Tony Fauci, you can have one of each. Political, mm -hmm. he said, it was speaking up against the president. Uh, that was uh, not something I wanted to do, but I had to do it and say he was wrong. Scientifically, right. It was telling my people at the Vaccine Research Center, just be ready. When we get the genome of the virus, I will have money for you. I will have support. You can start working on the vaccine. That's what Fauci told me. And Barney Graham was the fellow who, who started on that work. But it all happened within, within minutes around the world. That viral genome flew so that we could have a vaccine as quickly as possible. Super quick. What's the perception about uh, Fauci in US? Because I, 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 I'm not into the topic, so I, I don't know exactly. I'm, I'm, I don't live in US, so I don't know. But I often see a very like everyone. I mean, like Elon Musk. You have controversial opinion. He's a genius. No, he's evil. I mean, what, what's do you think the general perception of, of Fauci in US? Well, it's very polarized. It's like a per perfect example of how polarized opinion is. Uh, political and even scientific in the U.S., other places too. There are many people who uh, think that Tony Fauci is the greatest hero of COVID-19 and that he was, a, he was an absolutely crucial scientific and public health official and voice during those early months and, and years of COVID-19. And there are other people who think he's, you know, He's making money from this. He's evil. He's he's conspiring to right. to conceal things about the virus. Um, I'm I don't know him well, but I've known him a little bit for a number of years and have interviewed him for this book. And uh, I have a very 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 high respect for him. So do a lot of other people in the U.S., but not everybody. Got it. Got it. Uh, David, uh, final uh, question, then I, I, I let you go. What, what do you think that is uh, coming out of uh, um, Senza Respiro? Um, what kind of uh, scenario do we have in front 
for the next few years. Uh, there is a sort of picture that that you can start that, that you start to have, or you think, look, probably the next few years we have to expect this situation. And um, is is it any clear uh, picture? Yeah. yeah. That well, that is I out there. The 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 picture that um, people should take, I think, is that. Um, this is not a one-time experience. First of all, it's not over. We will continue to deal with this virus for a long, long time, and we need to, to, to protect ourselves with vaccine and vaccine education. Uh, but apart from this virus, there will be others that spill over from wild animals into humans, dangerous new viruses, novel viruses in humans. And when, when a new virus spills over, viruses New, new to humans come from wild animals. When a virus spills over into humans, it can be very dangerous, but there's a potential to contain that spillover when just 20 or 30 people have become sick. Um, if it's not contained and it happens to be highly transmissible, then it can spread and become an epidemic or a pandemic. We will be challenged in that way by more viruses there will be new viruses we can even predict what kinds of viruses more coronaviruses more influenza viruses more viruses with rna genomes as opposed to dna genomes that evolve quickly they will come from animals and get into humans we have to be prepared to do a much better job than we did with covid 19 of containing detecting spotting those spillovers and containing them before they spread. And we can do that, but we so far we have not absorbed that lesson and we're not doing what's necessary to be prepared for the next one. Is there any technological advancement at the horizon that maybe can give us like a all in <laughs> a all in vaccine And that's it, you know, whatever is coming, we are ready or it's just impossible. And, well, the uh, idea of a universal vaccine has been thought about for for years, for decades, but um, it's it's very, uh, viruses differ from one another enough that it's it's very unlikely that we can have a vaccine against all viruses. What people hope right. for is that perhaps we could have a quote unquote universal vaccine against coronaviruses, and maybe right. another universal vaccine against influenza viruses, so that we could be prepared not just to deal with this coronavirus, but the next coronavirus. That's, uh, that's a realistic goal, but it's not an easily achieved goal. Got it. David, thank you so much for, for this chat. I really appreciate Congratulations for all of your work. I, I hope to talk with you soon or meet you soon in person. I hope so too, Monty. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Have a great 2023. Fantastic 2023. Thank you so much. I'll see you soon. Ciao.